Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the apostle for the restoration of the original first century faith. We get asked a lot of questions about what are the differences between Christians, Messianics, and Nazarenes. So what we thought we would do in this video series is we thought we would not only compare and contrast these groups and show how they relate to one another, but we wanted to show you spiritually where these groups come from particularly with regard to Israel's long and storied history. So what we want to do in this first part of this video series is we want to talk about the background, the history leading up to Yeshua's ministry in the first century before we talk about the nature of Yeshua's ministry in part two of this video series. We're gonna cover a lot of ground in this video but it's not even going to cover a tenth of the information that you can find in the full study, which is Nazarene Israel, the original faith of the apostles. And if you'd like to get a copy of this study, you can read it free online, or you can download a PDF copy in English, Spanish, or German from nazareneisrael.org. You can also purchase a paperback copy from amazon.com at our cost. We're going to cover a lot of ground in this video series, but we're going to see that it boils down to four main points. And the first point is that in the first century, there were four main groups that believed on the Messiah and followed his teachings, each in their own way. The first group was what's today called the Messianic Jews. And we're going to take a look not just at what they believe, but also spiritually their roots in history where they come from before the first century. Then we're gonna take a look at the group called the Gnostics. We're also gonna take a deep look at the Christian faith as well as their historical roots where they show up in scripture 300 years prior to Yeshua's ministry. Then we're gonna look at these first three groups and we're gonna see how they relate to and were served by the original first century faith that Yeshua taught his disciples to keep which was called Nazarene Israel. We're also going to talk about the good news, and we're going to see a two-step process of salvation. What we're going to see is that first Christianity would take a modified version of the good news into all the world, taking it to the ends of the earth. But that one of the things Christianity was not aware of is that part of their job would be to regather the lost tribes of the nation of Israel into the greater body of Christendom worldwide. We're also going to see that once Christianity had taken their modified version of the good news to the ends of the earth, that's when the original first century Nazarene Israelite faith and the original good news would begin to be restored. So because people are coming both from the Jewish and from the Christian end of things, and because people come from all different backgrounds and have different understandings of what scripture says, we need to just take a few slides and back up and talk about the patriarchs. So briefly, the patriarchs were named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was also called Israel, and he had 12 sons who would later become the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph was one of the youngest sons, and he was sold down into slavery in Egypt. And we're going to see the spiritualism, the symbolism. We're going to see how Egypt is symbolic of the world and the world system. And while Joseph was in Egypt, while he was in the world, he had two sons. One was named Manasseh, and the other son was named Ephraim. So when you see the name Ephraim, just know that Ephraim was Joseph's son. Then we're also going to see how Israel, the whole nation, went down into Egypt for 430 years, where eventually they ended up in hard bondage and slavery. Then, after 430 years, Yahweh sent a prophet called Moses, or Moshe, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then his disciple Joshua brought the children of Israel into the land of Israel to settle it. Now, what we're going to see after this is we're going to see a 480-year period that's commonly called the Era of Judges. And what we're going to see is that in the Era of Judges, something a lot of Christians and Jews don't know about, is there was a de facto separation that took place between the 12 tribes of Israel 
into what are called the two houses of Israel. What we're going to see is that 10 of the tribes ended up associating or affiliating or congregating in the north. And these would create what's called all throughout the prophecies and all throughout scripture, the northern house of Israel, also called the house of Ephraim. And because Ephraim is Joseph's son, sometimes it's symbolically or poetically referred to as Joseph. We're also going to see where the Messiah makes, and the apostles also, make reference to these terms. Then in addition to the 10 tribes of the house of Israel in the north, we're also going to see two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. And we're going to see how they are called the house of Judah, also sometimes called in prophecy, the house of Jacob but we're going to see that there was a difference between these two houses of Israel even before the united monarchy took place. So after the 480 year era of judges, then we have what's called the united monarchy. And we had three kings. One king was Saul or Shaul, and then we had kings David and Solomon. And they ruled from the southern portion of the land from Jerusalem and they ruled over all 12 tribes, even though there was already this division. But one of the problems is that King Solomon worshiped idols. And because of King Solomon's idol worship, the kingdom was prophesied to split into two kingdoms. From this point forward, it would not be one kingdom with two houses, but it would be two separate kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. First, we want to talk about the northern ten tribes. Then we're going to talk later in this presentation about the southern two tribes. And then we're going to see the prophetic basis that establishes how they're supposed to come back together in the end times, unified in Yeshua. So the northern ten tribes at this point was called the northern kingdom of Israel. And they had their own separate king, distinct from the Jewish king in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom of Israel is also called the house of Israel in prophecy. It's also called the house of Ephraim. And because Ephraim was Joseph's son, it's sometimes poetically or symbolically called Joseph. The capital city was established in Samaria. So also in the prophecies where we see references to Samaria, we know that that's, these are all references to the northern ten tribes. And the northern kingdom's sin the violation of the laws of Moses was particularly bad. They, the leader established idol worship in Dan and Bethel. The leader also changed the dates of worship and established a new priesthood that was not of the sons of Levi. And this was a problem because these violations would cause the father Yahweh, as we explained in the Nazarene Israel study, these violations would lead the Father Yahweh to scatter the ten tribes out into the world like seed. They'd be scattered, symbolic of how Joseph went down into Egypt. And as we cover in the Nazarene Israel study, the prophecies were that they would be regathered some 2,730 years later. So what we're going to see is that because of the northern kingdom's sin, they will be taken into what's called the Assyrian captivity or the Assyrian dispersion. And this began around 732 BCE. When we add the prophesied 2,730 years of captivity to that, we come up with a beginning of the restoration date of 1998 CE. We see the start of the Assyrian captivity, also called the dispersion, in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 5 which tells us that the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria. So we see that term, we understand it's a reference to Ephraim, and besieged it for three years. Continuing on in verse 6, we read that in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria. So this is what is called the Assyrian captivity, or the dispersion, or the diaspora. So, and this is what the Messiah, Yeshua, is referring to in the famous prophecy in Luke chapter 418, where he stands up, excuse me, where he reads prophecy in the famous passage in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, where he announces what his ministry is going to be all about. And he says, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me 
to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives. And one of the things many people read this, and if we don't have an understanding or an appreciation of the history of the nation of Israel, a lot of people assume that this means that we should go down to the local jail or the local penitentiary and begin a prison ministry. And while that's a very, very good thing to do, that's not what Yeshua is speaking about in this passage. What he's talking about is to recover the children of Israel, the northern tribes, from spiritual captivity out in the world. First they're sold into Assyria, but that becomes a kind of spiritual Egypt out in the world. We have other witnesses to this from Yeshua's testimony himself. So in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, Yeshua answered and said, I was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And here he's referring to the northern ten tribes of the house of Ephraim, what are sometimes referred to as the lost ten tribes. And it's not just Yeshua who makes references to this. We also see references in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, where Kepha or Peter says, Kepha or Peter, an apostle of Yeshua Messiah, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. And in context, he's talking about the Assyrian dispersion, the diaspora, what's also known as the seeding. Because as we show in the Nazarene Israel study, the prophecies were in Hosea that the children of Israel would be scattered out into the world like seed so that Abraham's genetics would be mixed with all the world. And then in James chapter one and verse one, we're told that Yaakov or James a bondservant of Elohim and of Yahweh Yeshua Messiah to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. And one of the things that we notice about this particular passage is he's referring to the 12 tribes and not just 10. So we can ask ourselves, why did he say 12 here? And there's a number of uh, very good reasons. But one of the things was when the Assyrians came down to take the northern 10 tribes away, they didn't necessarily stop at the border. They were simply trying to expand their territory and take as many captives and as much loot as they could. So they actually took the majority of the southern kingdom of Judah as well. So the southern two tribes were called the house of Judah or actually the kingdom of Judah at this point. And this is where the Jews come from. The Jews today are a remnant of this people. And while the Jews were generally speaking much better about obeying the laws of Moses than the northern 10 tribes, one of the problems was that Judah did not allow the land to rest. And because this was a violation of the laws of Moses, the punishment that was given in Ezekiel chapter four was that Judah was to spend 70 years in what's called the exile to Babylon. And so when we see the term dispersion or diaspora, we need to know that that's a reference to the northern 10 tribes. And when we see a reference to the exile, that's a reference to the southern kingdom or the southern two tribes of the Jews. Uh, it's not always used that way and sometimes people confuse the terms. But technically speaking, the dispersion refers to the northern 10 tribes and the exiles refer to the southern two tribes. So when the southern kingdom of Judah went into the exile of Babylon, they had a large number of problems. Uh, one of the biggest problems was that there was no temple in Babylon. So there was no place for the people or the priests to congregate and also for the people to bring their tithes, gifts, and offerings. So without financial support, no priesthood can long survive. And so the Levitical order collapsed and this led to a severe leadership vacuum the people effectively began assimilating into Babylon. They, became, they started becoming spiritually Babylonian. So this was a real crisis and something had to be done in order to stop the Jewish people from assimilating into the land of Babylon. And the solution that was struck upon was the creation of the establishment of what's now today called the rabbinical order. And we might roughly translate this as the order of the great ones. So in Hebrew, the term rav means great. And when we add a yud suffix to that, we end up with ravi or rabi, which means my great or effectively my great one. And so this became the new priesthood instead of the Levitical order. 
And the thing about the rabbinical order is instead of enforcing Yahweh's commandments, as the Torah of the law of Moses says, the rabbis will follow the law of Moses, except they will deviate and depart from it in some places. And what this has to do with, or what it's called, takanot and ma'asim, or might be loosely translated, traditions and works. So what will happen is that when the rabbis run into a difficult situation or when they want to emphasize something, uh, a rabbi will make a tradition. And if this tradition is still being practiced three or four generations later, it will be considered to have the weight of law. So uh, Wikipedia puts it this way. When we look up takanot, we get the singular is takana, and that's called a positive legislation. In other words, practices practices, it's not, it's not law of Moses, but it's a positive legislation or a takana. And a takana, this is one of the practices instituted by the rabbis, which is not necessarily directly based on the laws of Moses, the commandments and the laws of Moses. As such, in other words, so when the rabbis create uh, their own legislation, something that they're supposed to follow, this is called a rabbinical mitzvah or a rabbinical commandment. And this is supposed to be distinct from the laws of Moses, even though the distinction gets blurred in actual practice. So continuing forward, it says, the Talmud states that in exceptional cases, the Jewish sages had the authority to make what's called a gezera or a prohibition, even if it would quote unquote, uproot a matter from the Torah. Now notice what's being said here. What's being said is that the rabbis now have the authority to directly violate or supplant even to uproot the laws of Moses. Now this is a very, very different understanding than what Yahweh himself commanded in the Torah. So understand the Jews found themselves in a crisis situation, but and the solution they came up with was good for the time that they were in the exile to Babylon. But then when they came back from the land of Babylon, back to the land of Israel, they didn't drop the rabbinical order and go back to the Levitical system of doing things. And this led to a severe problem that continues even to this day. And I say this with respect, and I'm sure I'm going to hear about this from my rabbi and rabbits and friends. But we need to speak the truth and we need to be honest and speak the truth in love. Now we need to understand the difference between the Levitical order, the Levitical set of commandments that comes through the laws of Moses and the rabbinical mitzvot, the rabbinic commandments. So understand that before Babylon, Israel was considered to be under the Levitical order. And in the Levitical order, Yahweh gave his laws or his instructions, what's called his Torah, to the nation of Israel through his servant Moses or Moshe. And that's why it's called the Torah Moshe or the instructions of Moses. Now notice, very important, the role of the Levites was not to create their own commandments, but it was to teach and enforce the laws that Yahweh himself had given. And that's a very important point that oftentimes gets lost. Now notice, in the laws of Moses, Yahweh is very specific that he doesn't want us changing or, re or rearranging or modifying or adding fence laws or these sorts of things to the commandments. And I'm trying to say this in love. But in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, because we need to speak the truth in love and not, not speak the truth out of love. He, in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, Yahweh says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you. So what he's effectively saying here is, I want you to keep my commandments. And if you start changing them or rearranging them or modifying them in any way, they're not really my commandments anymore. Now at this point, they're your commandments. And this is one of the problems is because while the, the rabbis in general adhere to the Torah Moshe, they don't mind adding and rearranging and changing things based on this concept or this understanding that they have, that they have the authority to make modifications to the Torah Moshe. 
And again, this stems from Babylon. Now notice something very important. In Babylon, in the Babylonian exile, what happened was that the rabbis began teaching not that they were in the exile, not that they had to do something exceptional for 70 years and they were going to go back to the Levitical order and they were going to go back to the Torah of Moses one day. But rather, the rabbis began teaching that Yahweh had given the great men of each generation the authority to establish what's called Torah law for that generation. In other words, And there's even a famous saying about in each generation or in every generation, Yahweh raises up great men to lead the nation. And the difference is, once again, essentially, effectively, who's in charge? Who has the authority? According to Yahweh, in the Torah Moshe, only Yahweh has the authority to establish law, and he doesn't want them changed. But according to what we just read and understand from the rabbinical order, the rabbis have this authority. And even though uh, they're only supposed to use it in exceptional situations, that's not how it's done in practice. So again, uh, when we follow the laws of Moses, the Levites teach and enforce Yahweh's laws. That's what's called the Torah Moshe. And under the rabbinical Torah, the rabbinical mitzvot, the rabbis have been given the authority to make their own laws. And while they defer to the Torah of Moshe, while they're pleased when the Torah of Moshe is fulfilled, they don't necessarily consider themselves bound by the Torah of Moshe. And that's what's called the rabbinic Torah law. So if you ask the rabbis, and this is one thing that gets a lot of Christians confused, is if you ask a rabbi, do you keep the Torah? They'll say, yes, of course. You say, well, do you keep the Torah of Moses? And they'll say, no. They'll say, do you keep the rabbinic Torah law? And they'll say, yes. So as we find and we catalog in the Nazarene Israel, well, not catalog, but as we explain in the Nazarene Israel study, there's differences in the terminology between English and Yiddish English, so to speak. There's a difference in definitions between English and Hebraic thought. And a lot of times what those who were raised in a Christian paradigm, their understanding is very different than what's actually being said because words have different meanings. But notice what we're going to see both from this point forward and also in subsequent parts of this video is that Yeshua wanted his disciples to keep the Torah of Moshe, the laws of Moses. Now notice in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1, It says, then the scribes of the Karaites and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yeshua saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Why do they transgress the Tachano and Maasim? Why are they not keeping what are considered binding rabbinical mitzvot? He says, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And the rabbinical uh, hand-washing custom, perhaps you've seen it, it doesn't have anything to do with physically getting the dirt out. It doesn't have to do with sanitation, but it's a a ritual prayer that is said while washing your hands. And if you don't say this prayer, then according to the tradition that was established, the meal is not a valid offering, so to speak. So this is something that's been added according to rabbinic tradition that carried on three or four generations, and then now it was considered to have the weight of law in the rabbinical order as this particular tradition does today. So in Matthew 15 and verse 3, Yeshua answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of Elohim, meaning the Torah of Moshe, because of your tradition? And there's many more witnesses to this. So in verse 6, Matthew 15 and verse 6, Yeshua says, for thus you have made the commandment of Elohim of no effect by your tradition. So what we see here is that Yeshua is not complaining. His, his, I believe his main complaint with the rabbinical order was that they were still following the rabbinical system instead of truly going back only to the commandments of Yahweh as given in the Torah of Moshe, as we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, where Yahweh says, do not add and do not take away to the commandments that I give you 
that you may keep my commandments effectively. So this is why Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, he says, referring to, and I say this in love, but referring to the rabbis, he says, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, which is precisely what the rabbinical order teaches, which is why Nazarene Israel is not rabbinical. So now that we have seen how the northern kingdom was sent into the dispersion and how the southern kingdom went into the exile and how they uh, effectively changed their leadership style, now we need to understand why the rabbinical order is effectively spiritually still in Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, we're shown how King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had a dream vision of a statue that was set up on the earth in five parts. This represented a series of empires which would all be Babylonian in nature, meaning that effectively in some form or fashion or another, they would follow Babylonian ways and effectively would also worship Babylonian gods and goddesses from the Babylonian pantheon. So we've just seen how the rabbinical order was created in Babylon And this is why we say that the rabbinical order departed from Yahweh in Babylon and effectively is still in Babylon. And we'll see how they show up again in the first century times in the second part of this video series. The second empire, which was still Babylonian in nature, was the Medo-Persian Empire. It's depicted as the silver and arms, or the chest and arms of silver. Then the third manifestation of the Babylonian Empire was Alexander the Great's Macedonian or Greek Empire. And they conquered the land of Israel around 330 years before Yeshua was born. And it wasn't Alexander, but we'll see in a moment, that his successor Antiochus Epiphanes began systematically punishing anyone who practiced the worship of Yahweh, which is something we might expect from a Babylonian style empire. Then by the time of the first century, uh, the Roman legions, the Roman Empire, had conquered the land of Israel. And so then, as we show in the study, Revelation in the end times, in the year 284, uh, Roman Emperor Constantine's cousin, Diocletian, divided the administration of the empire into two parts. And we talk about that more in the Revelation, in the study, Revelation in the end times. But now we had an eastern and a western leg, literally, these are the terms that were used historically, we had an eastern and western leg of the Roman Empire. And since we know that iron symbolizes Rome, the two feet of iron mixed with miry clay have to be iron, excuse me, has to be Rome mixed with something else. And what we see is that while the first four manifestations of the statue were physical empires, The fifth iteration, the fifth manifestation, was a spiritual extension of the first four. And as we show in the study, Revelation in the End Times, this represents Christianity mixed with Islam. And this is what all the refugee crises are all about, is these pockets or enclaves of miry clay are being injected into uh, what we might call Greco-Roman or a Greco-Roman mystery Babylonian style Christianity. So we know from the book of Revelation that mystery Babylon uh, represents the church. And this is where the lost tribes, if Judah is still lost in Babylon, if the two tribes are lost in Babylon, this is where the 10 tribes are lost today is in the feet of iron. And then of course, also with the miry clay, which is symbolic of cousin Ishmael. We talk more about that in the Revelation study. So now in order to understand where Christianity comes from, we need to zoom in and take a closer look at the third manifestation, the third iteration, the belly and thighs of bronze, which represents Alexander the Great's Macedonian Empire. So after the reign of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great uh, died after only a few years of conquest. And as he was dying, he bequeathed his empire to four successors. And the successor that was to rule over the land of Israel was named King Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes decided that it was very important to enforce the Greek faith. 
So he, he then commanded everyone to give up other faiths or, and to convert to the Hellenistic style worship or face death. And what we're going to see is that this raised a new class of people that Yahweh will use uh, to help fulfill the Great Commission in his own special way. So we're going to go to the book of 1 Maccabees. And we're going to use the version that was included in the apocryphal portion of the 1611 King James. So 1 Maccabees chapter 1, starting in verse 41, tells us that moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, meaning that they should all have the same religion because that's the understanding is religion is what binds people together. If you don't have a common faith, you're not a common people. Verse 42, he says, and that everyone should leave his laws, meaning the laws of his religion. And so all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Of course they did because they're Gentiles. It wasn't important to them. So continuing on in verse 43, he says, ah, but yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion, his Greek Hellenistic, basically Babylonian, third, third level Babylonian religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. Now let's jump to verse 48. He says that they should also leave their children uncircumcised as the Christians would later command and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation. So this again, this we're setting the stage for what the Hellenistic Christians would later do. Verse 49, he says, to the end that they might forget the law as the papacy commands us to do and change all the ordinances as we'll see the papacy commands us to do. Verse 50, and whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said, he should die. And this is as the papacy has commanded, as every other Babylonian style leadership has commanded, is eventually they persecute those who are worshiping the, the Israelite worship. So, but notice something very important is going to happen during this time of persecution. Uh, we're going to have a separation between the people who are actually practicing the worship of Yahweh and the people who are not. And this is very important because the main point we need to make on this is that in scripture, your religion is your race. In other words, there's no difference between your religion and your nationality or your ethnicity. That's all one thing. Or at some point or other, you know, Ruth the Moabitess was joined to the nation of Israel and she became a Jewess. So she had Moabite roots, but she became accepted. She grafted into the nation of Israel. That's always been the case. Uh, Gentiles have always been able to graft into the nation of Israel by joining the people of Israel and obeying the laws of Moses. That's always been the case. But the point we need to make here is that in scripture and the way Yahweh looks at things and remembering his ways are higher than our ways. In scripture, your religion is your race. That's it. Either you're an Israelite and you practice Israelite worship or not. But what happened in the reign of King Antiochus is that he created basically a hyphenated class of citizens. He created Greek Jews. Now, he still considered them to be Jewish. They, they weren't ethnically Greek. They were ethnically Jewish, but they practiced the Greek forms of worship. So they be, this is why they are called Greeks in the first or in the first century, in the first century writings in the Renewed Covenant. But notice what had happened, what we're pointing out here, is that religion and nationality had become two separate things. And this is going to be important for us to understand in the Christian era, is because in Christianity, uh, your religion and your nationality can be two different things. For example, you might have a, uh, a Roman Christian, or you might have a, a Christian in Greece or a Christian in Russia. You'd have a Russian Christian. Uh, you might also have a Christian in Chile or in America. So your nationality and your religion could be two separate things, even back in the ages of European kings. So uh, this lays the groundwork for that. Now that we understand these things, now we're ready to take a look at the four main groups 
in first century Judaism as recorded in the Renewed Covenant. There's more groups than this, but these are the four main ones. The first group is the sect of the Pharisees. They're the largest sect. Uh, today, they're called the Orthodox Jews. They simply changed their name in the Middle Ages. But as we just saw, they are rabbinical in nature, meaning they follow the rabbinical order, which was created, as we saw, by Jews in the land of Babylon. So this is one reason why scripture refers to them in the classification of Jews is because the scripture in general and the renewed covenant in particular labels us according not necessarily to our ethnicity, but according to our faith. And because the Pharisees followed a faith that was created by Jews, that's why the renewed covenant calls them Jews. The second sect was the sect of the Sadducees, also called the scribes of the renewed covenant. Again, they changed the name in the Middle Ages, and today they're called the Karaite Jews. Once again, because this sect derives from Babylon, and the Karaites may not agree with that, but because this sect derives from Babylon and was created effectively by Jews in Babylon, that's why they're called Jews. So the third group, can't really call it a sect, but the third group was created during Alexander the Great's invasion of the land in 330 BCE, and especially under the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. And this is what the Renewed Covenant calls the Hellenists, or the Greeks, of the Renewed Covenant. And we know that these were not non-Jews, these weren't ethnic Greeks, they were Jews who had learned to practice Hellenistic worship, or at least incorporate Hellenistic aspects into their worship. Uh, sort of a mixed worship sort of a thing, because the first true non-Jews to be brought into the faith was Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So while we're here in the good news, in the Gospels, we know that these are Hellenistic Jews, and these are what would later become known or called the Christianos. And the reason why is the Christianos are also feel themselves free to choose and not choose which of the commandments they're going to keep and which of the commandments they're not going to keep. Now notice, prior to the Greek invasion, uh, Judaism was effectively monolithic. It was all one thing. Uh, either you were Pharisee or you were Sadducee, but you were expect. and within Pharisaism, there were other minor sects, but, but the commandments, including the rabbinical commandments, were considered binding. But whereas with the Hellenistic invasion, all of a sudden you had a halakha or a, a set of practices, a body of faith that was not necessarily considered binding, but each person was allowed to choose for his or herself and to various degrees. And this is similar to the ethics that we find today in, say, Reconstruction Judaism, uh, also in Christianity, is because each individual Christian or each individual Reconstructionist Jew feels that it's okay to decide for his or herself which of the commandments they're going to keep and not keep. But because this classification of people was an outgrowth of the Greek invasion, that's why the Renewed Covenant refers to them as Greeks. And then in the first century, we're going to see the third sect, but the fourth group, and that's going to be the sect of the Nazarenes, or the Netzarim in Hebrew. And those are distinct from the Notzarim, which we'll see later refers to the Christians. But the Nazarenes, or the Netzarim, they're going to be classified as the Hebrews of the Renewed Covenant. And the reason why is because the Nazarenes, as we'll see in part two of this video, they adhere to the original Torah of Moses and not to the rabbinical Torah. And also they don't pick and choose as the classification of the Greeks do, but rather as true Hebrews, they take on the whole of the Torah of Moshe that was commanded at Mount Sinai. As we pick up in the next video, we're going to see the same four main points. And the first of those points is that in the first century, we're going to see the forerunners in the next video of what today are called the Messianic Jews. And these forerunners are going to be called the Pharisees who believe. And they're going to be an outgrowth of this Pharisaic order which was created in Babylon and governed ultimately by the rabbis. 
in the next video, we're also going to see a group called the Gnostics. And in this video, we've seen the Hellenistic and Babylonian forerunners of the Roman style or what's called Greco-Roman Babylonian Christianity, which began to be established due to Alexander the Great's invasion circa 330 BCE. And then we're also going to see how all three of these groups not only were much larger than the original Nazarene Israelite faith, but we're going to start to see the relationship between these three other groups and the original first century Nazarene Israelite faith. We're also going to talk about how the good news gets taken to the four corners of the globe. And what we're going to see is that there's a two-step process involved. It would not be the Nazarenes, but it would be the Hellenistic style Christians that would originally take a modified version of the good news into all the world with a purpose unbeknownst to them of finding the lost and scattered tribes of Israel and bringing them into the greater body of Christendom worldwide. And then, once the good news had been taken to the ends of the earth, that's when the original Nazarene Israelite faith would begin to be restored. And as we saw in the Nazarene Israel study, uh, that process began around 1996 to 1998 and the year 2000. If you want to know more, I encourage you to get a copy of the written version of Nazarene Israel, the original faith of the apostles. You can download a PDF copy for free in English, Spanish, or German, or you can read it free on the pages of the website at nazareneisrael.org. You can also purchase a paperback copy at our cost from amazon.com. So I hope to see you all again in part two of this video where we talk about the nature of Yeshua's ministry. Shalom.